Welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming tonight. Uh, as moderator this evening, I promise to keep the salesman's jokes to a minimum, although, of course, I won't be able to resist sharing a couple of my own favorites. Uh, actually, the subject for discussion tonight is not a, f a funny one. I won't attempt to summarize Earl Shores's thesis uh, and from a nation of salesmen, but I will make the observation that the overselling of America or the oversold economy is probably one of the darker and grimmer topics the Ford Hall Forum will confront this year. This grimness, I think, is engendered in part by the sheer relentlessness of today's sales culture, a relentlessness which makes our prototypical 1950s salesman, Willie Lohman, appear rather happy-go-lucky by comparison, and which makes 1960s-style materialism, remember that epithet, seem almost quaint. In part, the grimness of the sales culture, and believe me, I, I live with it every day, is caused by the salesmen themselves particularly people in the advertising and public relations businesses. Whereas as recently as the early 1970s, one could find a fair amount of healthy self-mockery among advertising people, today it's very difficult to find anyone in advertising who does not take themselves very seriously indeed. This humorlessness is one of the reasons it's difficult to talk freely about the American sales culture. The salesmen themselves are afraid to laugh at themselves, to let down their guard, or to talk honestly about what they do or what is being done to them and our country. Even when the salesmen consciously attempt self-referential humor or irony, such as the new TV advertisement I hope you've seen for the New York Times that employs as a pitch man the noted Times hater, Rush Limbaugh, the result, I think, is rather sinister and not at all funny. Now, fortunately, Earl Shoris lost neither his sense of humor nor his mind during 30-odd years in advertising, and his new book, A Nation of Salesmen, which, by the way, will be on sale uh, at the end of the evening, and, and which, by the way, is excerpted in this month's Harper's Magazine on sale at newsstands everywhere, <laughs> is, is, in my opinion, the most important and upsetting book to appear on the American sales culture in many years. This is largely due to Earl's talents as a writer and thinker, but it's also a consequence of his vast experience in the trenches of the advertising business, having done everything from creating very literary ads for a clothing retailer in San Francisco to, in later years, advising the chairman of General Motors and AT&T on how to portray their huge corporations in the public marketplace, which is something akin to advising the leaders of small nation states on how to behave in the world community. Earl was able, fortunately, to write books in his spare time, that is, from 11 p.m. to 4 a.m., and they include works of fiction as well as nonfiction. Uh, I think I might embarrass Earl if I list all of them, but there are a lot of very, very good books. Um, it's our good fortune to have Earl, from Earl an honest book tonight, whose thesis will provide the centerpiece for our discussion. He's going to get about 30 minutes to explain what the book is about. And uh, I'll then give the floor to uh, an equally distinguished critic of the national sales culture, Mark Crispin Miller of Johns Hopkins University, who's um, a frequent contributor to Harper's Magazine. And uh, Professor Miller, I should tell you, is the author of Boxed In, The Culture of TV, and he's appeared as a critic and commentator on several television news broadcasts, both local and national, including NBC's Sunday Today, CNN's Inside Politics, and uh, the McNeil Lair News Hour. 
Uh, Mark will have about 10 minutes to respond, somewhat critically, I'm told, to Earl's remarks, after which I will very briefly step out of my moderator's role to relate one choice salesman story that you may or may not find amusing. That should leave about 45 minutes for pointed questions and debate. Let me turn it over to Earl Shores. Thank you, Rick, for uh, all the kind words. Um, since a lot of people here may have read the excerpt from the book uh, in Harper's, I'd like to tell you about some things that don't appear either in Harper's or in the book. First, to borrow an irony from an Australian film, My Brilliant Career. It began in San Francisco, where I quickly advanced from full-time to half-time to three hours a day, and finally was promoted to 10 hours a week. In New York, it was not so easy. There was a vast pool of banality. Bright young men and women who devoted their every waking hour to the cliche in word and image. And I had a problem. The ideas that made some people rich made me laugh. I had no choice but to become an executive. With the reduced workload of a senior officer, I was able to devote most of my energies to literature. But it was not all cakes and ale. Let me tell you a story that may at first seem self-serving. In fact, I hope it will be a little self-serving. But we'll point up the ethical difference between the forest and the trees. This is about the trees. Some years ago, there was a boycott of Nestle products because of the way the company marketed infant formula in Africa. They marketed the formula by giving it free to nursing mothers who used it for a month or two, during which time their milk dried up. Soon afterward, without money to buy more formula and no breast milk to feed their children, the mothers watched their babies suffer malnutrition, sickness, and sometimes death. The head of the New York office of the agency where I work telephoned me and asked if I would look into Nestle's PR and advertising problem and come up with a solution. He supplied me with reams of material about the case, all from the Nestle point of view. Three days later, he telephoned, and I had read the material, said, well, what's the answer? What does Nestle do? And, and I said, I have an, an answer for you. It's clear, it's simple, and it's guaranteed to work. Stop killing babies. Uh, Word, word of this ingenious solution got around very quickly, and not long afterward, the chairman of the agency described me as the conscience of the corporation. And that, for all practical purposes, was the end of my brilliant career. Um, there were no more promotions. Now, I tell you this to excuse my years in the business uh, and to amuse you a little, but also to make a point. I was able to endure my years uh, as a salesman by doing what I thought was ethical. I never sold cigarettes or liquor or weapons or whatever. Only later, when I was able to look at the forest, did I come to understand that I'd been part of the great army of salesmen who dominate American society, interfering in the freedom of the people, taking away their dignity. I had been that creature whom I term in my best mock Latin, homo vendens salesman. Now, I have no quarrel with one sale or one salesman unless the salesman is deceitful or the product is harmful. What I take issue with is a nation of salesmen, for that situation adversely affects the social, political, cultural, ethical, and economic life of this country. I'll begin the conversation by laying down the basic arguments that are in the book. First, with the defense of the salesman as a necessary part of society. Then with some thoughts about his role in the question of appearance and reality, a look at the subversion of culture, a definition of homo vendens, his effect on human dignity in our time, and finally, an attempt at a response to the problem. Let's begin at the beginning. There was a salesman in paradise. It does not uh, matter whose paradise, Eden, the Sumerian paradise of Gilgamesh, Quetzalcoatl, Tula, and so on nor does it matter by what name the salesman is known, trickster, devil, courtesan, culture bearer, merchant, god. Human life always begins in paradise, and there is always a salesman involved in the conversion of the world from myth to historical reality. The salesman may be male or female, good or bad, human or animal, with or without godlike powers. There are many ambiguities in paradise, 
but there is always a salesman. In paradise, salesmen have these qualities in common. They speak, they influence others to act, but do not themselves participate in the action. They have the advantage of superior knowledge, that is, they know more about others than others know about them. They know a great deal about the world of things. They are privy either through observation, interrogation, or intuition to the deepest desires of others, and they are always outsiders, floaters, wanderers, creatures without roots, more act than substance. The salesman most familiar to the Western mind lived in Eden. He was a serpent. Since paradise, the salesman has always been unlike all other creatures of earth and imagination. He's a mediator. He does not sow and he does not hunt. Nevertheless, he eats. He is the creature who succeeds by guile, the trickster, the outside force who causes actions in which he has no stake. He is neither subject nor object, a middle without substance, the place beyond gravity, neither the maker nor the consumer, pure communication, the cost of living a human life. No one can judge the function of the salesman as no one can judge nature. He is. But the quantity and the cost of selling can be considered. The most significant observation I can offer is that a nation in which some salesmen necessarily live and work is not the same as a nation of salesmen. Do we have to have salesmen? Maybe not. At the beginning of the 1990s, a series of strange philosophical television commercials were broadcast in the eastern United States. You may have seen them. All of the commercials concluded with the same statement, Honda, the car that sells itself. Of course, a commercial that sells the car that sells itself is a problem either in logic or in ethics. It's either self-contradictory or a lie. But the question raised by the illogical philosophers at Honda's advertising agency is not so easily dismissed. Can anything sell itself? What would be required? And if not a Honda, then a pot, a knife, a spoon, a loaf of bread, a pinch of salt, water in a plastic jug, there must be something that can sell itself. Or do we live in a world we cannot ever hope to know? Does nothing speak to us? We have our senses, after all. Or do we? Imagine, if the world were exactly as it appears to us, things could and would truly sell themselves. In such a known world, no salesman could lie successfully, because every customer would know the truth about a product by its appearance. On the other hand, a salesman who told the truth would add nothing to the customer's knowledge of the product. The salesman would have no function. There is a logical answer to the marketplace problem of appearance and reality and a structural answer. And they are the same, the salesman. He is the necessary adjunct of appearances. Without a mediator, the commerce by which we move from moment to moment, act to act, would be stymied. Having seen that the salesman is the mediator between opposites, now mainly appearance and reality, there's a starting point from which to explore a definition of the salesman and his work. Once we recognize that perception is not reality, the sale ceases to be the exchange of a commodity for money or other valuable consideration. That's what the OED tells us was the classic definition in 1050. The exchange is not the sale, but the result of the sale. No exchange takes place in the sale. It is a mingling, a marriage of information and desire. The salesman changes the information about the product so that it fits the wishes of desire. But he does not change the product, and he does not create desire. The wishes for safety and pleasure, for comfort in things, for ease and immortality, are nature's gifts to the salesman. Desire is the garden the salesman inherits. He nurtures the fruits of his garden, choosing those that are proper to the seasons of his ambition. But he can only cultivate the garden of desire as it exists. The salesman came late to the world. He's not a god. He cannot invent the earth or extend the hours of the sun. The garden is. Now, many marriages are made in this garden. One of them is the selling of culture. It may be an error, a confusion of categories to consider the selling of culture aside from the general subject of this talk. But I think you know what I mean by culture, the arts, near arts, or crafts, intellectual pursuits, and so on. The question is where the influence of selling enters the world of culture. 
If, as in times past, the marketing of cultural objects comes after their production, if marketing is no more than a means of dissemination, culture continues along its ancient, crooked, much divided path. On the other hand, if marketing, with its scientific determination of the desires of the buyer, has reached back into the process of imagination, to the very soul of the maker, then marketing has begun to determine the course of human society in a limiting, perhaps profoundly conservative way. Virtually all producers of culture on an important scale are now market-driven organizations. They examine the tastes of the market, subject their findings to statistical analysis to produce a theoretical map of desire, then create objects of culture accordingly. Any product that doesn't fit the map is rejected. It's a closed system, but the owners of the system have proved that it is efficient. Newspapers, magazines, books, films, television programs all prosper inside the system. The insidious nature of the process enables the market researcher's abstraction to penetrate the imagination of the artist. What may appear as innovation has already been subjected to the constraints of the theoretical construction of desire. The artist comes to the corporate producer with a market-driven idea. To seal the circle against the intrusion of the new, the final products are subjected to market testing. If they don't satisfy the audience, they're changed or discarded. Nothing can be left to chance. The goal of all market-driven activity, including market-driven culture, is certainty. The closed system offers the same virtue advertised to cynical travelers by the Holiday Inn. No surprises. As market democracy drives culture to an ever-increasing extent, the principles of civil society fall victim to the economic and political power of the market. Canons of taste collapse first. The simplicity of violence replaces the complexity of social life. Sex loses its connection to love or exaltation. Poetry deteriorates into mindless rhyme. Music descends from the sound of the mind to the rumblings of the gut. When the market takes command of culture, the ethical question changes from how shall we live to what do we want. The explicit difference is in the loss of the sense of limits, the hesitation between the will and the act which can last forever in a society built on principle. Tocqueville's fears learned from Aristotle can be expressed as fears for the safety of culture and its quirky love of principle, its growth out of the peaceful, aesthetic engagement of one human being with others, with even one other. The market knows no peace. It cannot contemplate, it can only demand. When the market heeds the authority of culture, civil society proceeds at its ungainly, stuttering pace. But when the market, in its beastly abstraction, commands culture, the glories of civilization are pushed to the farthest margin and ethics has no place in the world. In such circumstances, hope lies in Sami's dot and the whispers of malcontents. The facts behind the concept of homo vendens may need to be rehearsed briefly here. Perhaps one comparison will serve. In 1993, the largest private uh, business with the greatest number of employees was still General Motors, but the business with the next greatest number was Walmart. Moreover, General Motors was shrinking while Walmart was growing. Since the late 1950s, Homo Vendens has been increasing his dominance. By 1990, the contest was over. He had superseded the other conceptions of man. Of course, selling did not begin after World War II, and mediation dates back to the earliest human ideas. The phrase homo vendens, like its predecessors, homo sapiens, homo religiosus, homo faber, and so on, is intended to mark the enthroning rather than the beginning of a concept. A mediator, by definition, may not belong to one side or the other. He neither makes nor buys goods or services. But this does not give him a political life, homo vendens. He cannot do politics because he does not act directly with other human beings. Things or matter always come between them. In other words, his actions in the world cannot ever be purely human. Homo vendens lives in the world with other men, but not among other men. 
He conceives of others as his business. He values them as his business. Business is the matter between them. Business is always about things, never about thinking, which cannot be manufactured or consumed. It is never so purely human that it can be political. When Homo Vendens executes his function in the world, he maintains his distance from those in the current transaction and all future transactions. The agonistic character of selling contributes to his isolation. The salesman hunts, and the hunter has no home, further isolating him from the political world. For politics, from the Greek polis, belongs to home, meaning not merely place, but association. Without a home, a person has nothing to defend and no place in which to build. In that sense, every salesman is a traveling salesman, no matter where he is and with whom he fosters transactions. In his role as mediator, Homo Vendens facilitates exchanges by providing information that weds desire to things. He operates on the principle that all value is exchange value, and as such is set by the market, no one else. He cannot make judgments. To judge means to apply a set of standards to a thing or act to value it. Neither the utility of the thing nor its other intrinsic qualities can change the judgment of the market. Nothing has value in itself. If no one wanted to buy the Mona Lisa, it would not be worth a dime. If there were, no, if there were more than enough happiness to go around, the price of happiness would fall. Surrounded by relative values, with no influence on the setting of those values, the salesman lives apart from the meaning of things and acts. After all, how can he know what something means if he cannot judge it, but must wait for others to do so, and then accept whatever they say as if he were a blank slate? Moreover, he must accept the judgment of the market as it happens. Yes one day, no the next. Good in the morning, bad in the evening. The judgments by which homo vendens live change constantly. Life is reduced to a process over which no one has control. An utterly mortal man, without politics, homo vendens has nothing to guide him, either in this life or the next. He bears the burden of the sadness of the age. He has no dignity. Now that may be an archaic idea, and it has several meanings. We think of the dignity of Cicero and the Romans. We think of the kind of dignity that comes in grand statements, etc. But there's a third kind that I would like to talk about. It has to do with intrinsic worth. The great proponent of this kind of dignity was Immanuel Kant. He said that man was not a means, but an end in himself, a person rather than a thing. And he said dignity was beyond price. His ideas were clear and flattering to human beings, but his sense of intrinsic dignity is not often discussed because this kind of dignity does not appear on the surface of life. It's around dignity that the little schoolmaster of Königsberg constructed his case for the autonomy of human beings and of human reason, arguing that man may obey only those laws he himself makes, then insisting that he must obey them, that it's his duty, the dignity of man, he said, consists in this capacity to legislate universally on condition that he obey his own legislation. I think Bertrand Russell once said that it was uh, really just another way of describing the golden rule. Here then is the connection of dignity to freedom. Human beings can do what they ought to do. They are free to be dignified. They are free to be human. When man has dignity, no one can buy him, no one can use him. Everything begins from him, from his own reason. He is the ruler of himself, the possessor of his own mind. The tension between man and salesman was, must finally be recognized as a struggle for dignity. Homo vendens wants for himself the dignity of Caesars and senators, which in our time has degenerated from decorum to renown. He does not want to think of how he also lives in society in a context of others, one of many. He does not want to think that making a means of the rest of the world also makes a means of him. Homo Vendens deals with his condition by shutting his eyes like a child. Uh, whatever he does not see does not exist. 
Homo vendens longs to return to this darkness always, to his lonely pleasure. But a man alone cannot be renowned just as he cannot be free. The salesman covets both lives. He wants to use others without being used. He wants to be famously alone. That is the salesman's antinomy, his stumbling place. He does not understand that one person alone cannot have dignity, just as one person alone cannot be free. Dignity occurs only among others, but not under the tyranny of others. When men use others as a means, when the market dictates the imagination and the act, the dream life as well as the day life of men, the true meaning of dignity comes clear. Kant didn't pin his ethics on decorum. By dignity, he meant free. He could not tolerate man as a means in the grasp of others, even in the grasp of God. He begins with man, with possibility. That is what is meant by freedom. That is the ethical question the triumph of homo vendens raises. Not the process of the transaction, but the ability to be free. The surrender of freedom is the sadness of this age. Under the dominion of homo vendens, man is no longer free to know the world. The salesman now informs him. In the mix of mind and matter, perception, the information comes not from the senses encountering reality, but from the salesman. Man has lost the world. By conceding the world to homo vendens, human beings enter into an agreement in which everything exists as part of a transaction. A man is interchangeable with a thing. He no longer determines his own worth. A price can be put on him. Man has lost his humanity. When homo vendens, who recognizes himself as merely a means, makes all men into a means for his use, he takes away their freedom. Man has lost his nobility. Under the conditions of a life dominated by homo vendens, an abstraction of desire, the unthinking market initiates action. The world no longer begins from man. He has forfeited the autonomy of his own reason. Man has lost his mind. Now, do I mean to say that all Americans are lunatics, including us, uh, and living in chains? Of course not. But freedom is a fragile thing, and it has to be initiated every day. And thinking is the hardest part of making men free. An alternative to the domination of homo vendens is no longer an easy choice, for the economy of the world is built upon the belief that the tutelage of the market has been inculcated in virtually everyone in the United States and is working its way into the cultures of the rest of the world. Sudden change would be catastrophic. Man, the customer, the thing the salesman puts to use cannot be made suddenly to disappear, replaced overnight by enlightenment's daring thinker. The cost of such a revolution would be too high. That long before the enlightenment, Socrates was asked what kind of life was worth living, and he spoke in defense of reason. He abjured the unexa unexamined life, choosing instead to die. Have courage was also his advice to the world. The choice in our time is not to die, but to think. For in thinking, freedom begins, and freedom is the antidote to homo vendens, the parent of autonomy. But how does thinking begin? What are the ingredients of the antidote? A plan for thinking that's as simple as the instructions for assembling a table or a toy cannot be written. In an earlier time, wonder was considered a beginning. Merely to separate oneself from nature was thought to be sufficient to trigger thought. No longer. Other possibilities having been lost to familiarity and indifference, the source of wonder now can only be astonishment at our own existence. This flash of awareness has been described by many writers, but rarely in a comprehensible way. It is the sudden recognition of one's own being, according to some, the sensation of one's physical presence in space, according to others, or it may be the experience of being within being. But I think it's not so arcane or complicated an idea. Wonder appears at the instant when a person sheds the modesty imposed upon him by others and recognizes the truth that everything must begin from man, not all men, but any man, any woman. At that moment, he bestows upon himself the dignity of creators. He becomes the mother and the father of the world, yet guided by a sense of limits, for he is uplifted by the joy of creation 
and burdened by the responsibility of freedom, a creature who has chosen out of recognition of the worth of his own being and beginning to think. Thank you. Um, basically, I, I, I would like to compliment, I guess with both an I and an E, uh, what Earl Shores has read and, and what he has written in A Nation of Salesmen. Uh, I think that his discussion of the anti-democratic bias of salesmanship is really indispensable and, and very beautifully done. And likewise, his analysis of the various ways in which the sales project actually promotes unhappiness is, is really quite poignant and, and in its form very original. So those of you who will read the book will discover that he introduces each of his analytical sections with a narrative which may or may not be based on a true story, I don't know. <laughs> he needn't tell us. But, no. <laughs> but it's, it's very, very uh, compelling and, and readable as well as suggestive. What I have to say tonight, uh, re again, really is intended to complement or maybe qualify some of the implications uh, or assumptions behind his, his book. Uh, as, as you can probably tell from listening to this very erudite presentation, Earl Shores' uh, analysis is very well informed by uh, really the entire history of Western philosophical thought. And he rightly, I think, uh, has chosen to examine the consumer culture and to examine advertising as expressions of the impulse to salesmanship. And I say that it's proper to do this because no less an authority than the great Claude Hopkins is probably the greatest copywriter of all time. I mean, after all, the man wrote, keep that schoolgirl complexion, you know, <laughs> right? And what else was it? The beer that made Milwaukee famous, he wrote that. Uh, uh, Earl Shores quotes him uh, in his book to the effect that advertising, I'm mangling his workaday prose, I mean Hopkins's, by uh, paraphrase, but um, advertising is simply salesmanship uh, on the mass scale. So there's, there's a historical basis and there's certainly logical grounds for regarding what we have now, the kind of thing that Rick MacArthur was talking about, the consumer culture we have now as continuous with salesmanship, which Earl points out begins in the Garden of Eden. But I would like to suggest that it might also be fruitful to regard what we have now as, as something of a departure from salesmanship, if for no other reason than the fact that salesmanship is as, as cold and rationalistic as it may be, a face-to-face -face or personal process, whereas advertising is an impersonal propaganda. Um, I want to talk just very briefly about some of the things that have happened to advertising since roughly the mid-70s, because I think they'll help us to appreciate the extent and the intensity of the grimness of what we have now, to use Rick's word. I think that the grimness of the consumer culture does not come simply from a grim, driven, unsatisfied subculture of American salesmanship. I think that it's more complicated than that. Basically, what we see now is, is, is a, a, a commercial spectacle in which a good many of the traditional humane or sociable appeals of advertising are, are missing. They're just not there. There is a, a remarkable perverseness to the commercial spectacle, which I think many people of a certain age have sensed from watching TV commercials and looking at print ads, and which I can assure you as a student of those images, uh, it really it is borne out by a historical study of advertising over time. Let me just give you a few examples, okay? And you're gonna have to forgive me for using the part to stand for the whole, but for every example I give you, 
I have hundreds more in my archive of slides. <laughs> Think of the Marlboro Man, for example. The Marlboro Man was not always into leather, you see. <laughs> he wasn't always so dauntingly kinky and domineering a figure. In the Marlboro ads of today, and it's been this way since roughly the mid-70s, the cowboy is a figure of threatening potency, and his attitude towards nature is combative and destructive. He is dressed to stand out against and to resist the elements. He often wears a yellow slicker to fight off the rain. He's often wearing chaps. He's often carrying a lasso. Now, what's interesting about the Marlboro advertising, if you look at it historically, is that even at its most macho in the 50s and 60s, there was always a strange uh, pastoral quality. Strange by our lights, not at all strange if you consider the advertising of the 50s and 60s. The pastoral element, in other words, is gone from advertising. Uh, Marlboro was a brand created in 1955 for uh, an enormous class of white collar workers about whom Earl talks in his book who had been in World War II and came back to work in an enormous uh, commercial uh, bureaucracy, felt unfulfilled. Marlboro was basically created out of a woman's brand, which had been in existence since 1927. The motto had been mild as May. Marlboro was redesigned. It was given this big macho makeover so that it could appeal to men who were stuck behind desks and who had memories of, of life in the trenches and felt understandably unfulfilled. Well, what's interesting is that the, the, uh, the, the ideal of manliness in those ads was not an ideal of domination. It was a pastoral ideal in which woman was tolerated, uh, but not ever, in any example I've seen, overtly threatened or bullied or belittled. The Marlboro Man now is a figure uh, for whom the steer is an enemy, the horse is an enemy. You know, there, there, there is very rarely a respite. There's very rarely a kind of pastoral quiet. Whereas in the, in the Marlboro ads of the late 50s and early 60s, the ads were often all in black and white so that it looked as if the cowboy was sort of em, an emanation of the wilderness, not at odds with it. Well, what, what we see with the Marlboro man is absolutely typical of cigarette advertising, really until the mid-70s. And the kind of brutality that we see in the Marlboro ads now, we also see in ads for cigarettes pitched to women. It makes no difference. It's, there's no sexism here. Whichever sex the smoker represents, that smoker is being titillated with a promise of power at its most brutal. My point is simply that many of the older pleasures associated with smoking, sociability, sex, reverie, I mean, these are appeals that are really as old as smoking itself, uh, that come from the 18th century, they're gone now, as is smoke itself. Never see smoke in a cigarette ad. Secondly, car advertising, and I'll, I'll try to pick up the pace here. You look at car advertising from the 50s and 60s, you're amazed to see that the car is often represented as doing its job best when it sits stock still beside a babbling brook or on a cliffside or maybe next to a townhouse. It depends on what kind of car we're talking about. But the fact is that the car is a means of transport to get you away from the rat race where you can just kind of hang out and let the wind ruffle your hair. The typical car ad now is, is as if filmed in a post-nuclear landscape, a moonscape. There is no world to be taken to. There is nothing but an endless highway. The car is there to take you alone, because usually you're by yourself, unless it's a, a, an RV or something big, so it's filled up with kids and you can see how roomy it is. But if it's just a car, you're in it by yourself, it's a completely impassive, faceless figure, and it's always speeding, you know? Art directors uh, uh, and cinematographers who work in car advertising say it's a bad idea to show the car amidst trees because the, the reflection of the foliage kind of screws up the finish, you know what I mean? Well, that's true, that's an aesthetic judgment, but it contains an ideological statement. We don't want leaves, we don't want trees, we just want the highway. We just want the bare, clean, depopulated surface of this 
orb where there is nothing but the commodity. Nothing but the commodity. That is grim. Right, and finally, travel advertising. If you look at travel advertising really from the 90s, I mean the last 90s, up through the mid-70s, more or less, you're, you're struck by the fact that there's an attempt to represent the exotic. Now, it's fraught with all kinds of racist uh, images and so on. There's no question about that. I don't mean to extol these images as progressive or exemplary in any way. They're dishonest. They're advertising. They hype the product. They make too much of the product. But the interesting difference between this older advertising and advertising now is that the product then was usually represented as a, as a ticket of entry into some vague utopian place that was out there. Now that is no longer the case. Now the world is a hell, is a dystopia, and there is the product that is the utopia, that has replaced the utopia. There is only the commodity, and that, I think, that is definitely <laughs> grim, you know. Uh, I think, actually, that the, the, the sad and chilling story that the images of advertising tell uh, simply bear out the, the general and very complex thesis of Earl Shores's excellent book. Thank you. I just cut a big fat paragraph from my remarks so we can get back on schedule. But I, thanks, Mark and Earl. I should tell you, I come from a long line of salesmen, beginning with my great grandfather, William Telfer MacArthur, who toiled most of his life as a minister and evangelist for the Christian Missionary Alliance, founding churches, or if you like, franchises around the country. And my salesman's genes are, my salesman's genes are very much intact, uh, so much so that Earl has good cause in his book to upbraid me and Harper's over an indiscretion involving absolute vodka, which we can talk about later. <laughs> Earl writes eloquently about the desperation of salesmen, a desperation I have felt keenly over the past 10 years as publisher of Harper's Magazine. Such feelings of desperation can lead to desperate acts. Just within the last uh, two months, I've sent a man dressed in a bear costume to make a sales call, uh, even more desperately, in order to impress an important advertising executive, I've dressed myself in a tuxedo and endured 90 minutes of deceptive banalities from Henry Kissinger. <laughs> but as I said, I have a favorite salesman story which might add something to the discussion. Uh, but I don't want to get away from the central thesis. Uh, in my other life as a journalist, I've contributed to the public's understanding of, of American and Kuwaiti propaganda before and during the Gulf War. Uh, the, as you may recall, the piece de resistance of the pre-war public relations campaign was uh, the stories about Iraqi soldiers killing babies by pulling them out of incubators in Kuwait City hospitals. Uh, supposedly in order to loot the incubators. Uh, in short, it was brilliant, enormously successful salesmanship. Indeed, I believe that it tipped the Senate in favor of war against Iraq, and it was entirely fraudulent. Now, after my book came out about the Gulf War in, in June of 1992, one of the chief salesmen uh, from Hill and Knowlton, the public relations firm which directly represented Kuwait and indirectly represented President Bush, called me up very angry about what I'd written. In the course of our conversation, I inquired about a discrepancy uh, between the spoken testimony of one of the phony witnesses to the baby killings and the printed press release summarizing that testimony. The spoken testimony had merely referred to babies, plural, whereas the press release specifically cited 15 babies pulled from incubators, quoting, supposedly quoting the, the witness. 
So we went around and around the way reporters do with their uh, targets until the salesman became exasperated with me and blurted out with unprecedented candor, oh, come on, John, who gives a shit if there were 15 babies or two? Now, the, the coldness of this statement, I have to admit, it, it gladdened my reporter's heart because it was so revealing. But as a citizen, I had to wonder if we had now achieved a new level of salesmanship in America, a level of shamelessness, uh, perhaps unprecedented in our history, where it really doesn't matter as long as the thing got sold. Uh, I should say that this particular saleswoman, uh, Lori Fitzpagato, has been fittingly enough rewarded with the job of Assistant Secretary of Commerce in the Clinton administration where she sells other countries on the notion of investing in or, or trading with the United States. Now, obviously, there are distinctions to be made between selling propaganda and selling goods and services. Uh, I don't think there's a salesman who can yet say to a customer, who gives a shit uh, if there was no engine in the car when I sold it to you? <laughs> But I'd be curious to hear from Earl and Mark and the audience if they think there's a new shamelessness uh, in this branch of sales or whether it's the same old shamelessness. And now, let's start the questions. I have to confess that the changes in advertising that you've described over the past 30 or 40 years have been a little too subtle for me to notice, but there is one uh, change that's very striking to me that I'd like you to comment on, and that is that the in, there's a lot of evidence that uh, some advertisers and sellers ha have basically r uh, accepted the idea that they've reached a limit. They can't sell the product for its own qualities. They can't sell it even for the idea that it's going to give you a better sex life. They can't sell it for the idea that you can gloat over your friends who don't have it. But they've got to now sell the buying process itself as an end in itself. You now have these shopping malls that are basically supposed to be the attraction. They're not a vehicle for you to buy the things that are in the mall. They are there so that you can build your life around the mall, so that you can eat in the mall, you can go to the movies in the mall, you can, you know, the teenagers can social to build their social life around the mall, so that they will basically become, I don't know the Latin word, equivalent of homo vendens, but the person who buys, that that is their only uh, focus in life, and that we need to create these people because we can no longer sell the product either directly through its qualities or indirectly through the secondary benefits that you might derive from it. Could you please comment on that? You got a preferred commentator? Well, Mr. Shores is okay. the star, I guess. I, I agree. I, I, I think uh, that you're, qu you're quite correct, that the transaction itself has become the end. And, and I think that's very much the problem of this creature, homo vendens, who I think is both a customer and a salesman. I think everyone is, is pretty much a salesman now, not merely the people who are in advertising. The people who do politics are salesmen. I think some of us think Mr. Clinton is a salesman. Some of us thought Mr. Bush is a salesman and so on. So yes, it is uh, everywhere, and it is the transaction that people value. That is the end. If if there's a, a, a subject and an object in the world, there's also a verb, and the verb is the transaction, and the verb is what everybody's about, and the verb, whatever it is interested in, and the verb doesn't exist. There is no, you, you can't see a verb, you can't touch a verb, you can't hold it. So the place in which the transaction uh, occurs is the place that attracts the salesman, both as, as the customer and as the seller, because everyone now thinks as a salesman. I think, I think you're exactly right, and you've put your finger on something interesting. I'd like to add something to that. Um, you, you mentioned something very important, because you're really not talking about advertising when you talk about the mall. You're talking about city planning. You're talking about architecture. You're talking about the organization of space 
for the uh, uh, enablement of, of nonstop consumption by large masses of people. You're talking about a site that is completely hermetically sealed. I mean, you know, they're private spaces, right? So if they want, and this was held up in court, they can prevent people from leafleting on their premises if they don't happen to like what the people are, are, rep, are you know, representing. And I mean, this you know, has profound implications for the whole notion of politics. Because you, know, you keep quoting Hannah Arendt, I think, very aptly, that, that a, a real politics isn't possible when, when there's no forum, when there's no village square. And that's, that's, what the, uh, you know, that's, that's what the shopping mall is. The shopping mall is, is, the, is the material temple of consumption. It, 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 it represents a physical realization of the kind of psychological experience we have when we just watch commercial TV all the time and read commercial magazines and read USA Today. It, it becomes an entirely sealed commercial environment, you know? And let me just say that if one inhabits that environment, then the kinds of changes I talked about may strike you as over subtle. But if you look, see, it's, it's crucially important to find some way to step outside of that bubble. I can only think of two. One is to, is to go abroad, uh, and the other is to go to the past. And if you just you know, go to the antique store and buy a bunch of Life magazines from 1957 and 8, compare the ads there with the ads in the latest, it, it'll, it'll really blow your mind. You, you can't, speaking of kids in malls, it is unimaginable that, that, that the equivalent of Nintendo, let's say Mattel, all right, Hasbro, 20 years ago, would have built a campaign around the slogan, Hockaloogie at life. <laughs> Hockaloogie at life, you know? I mean, that kind of sociopathic, you know, nastiness is, is re really new. Uh, and. Uh, not, not I subtle. think I that arises just because there's such fierce competition that they're, the advertisers are driven to sure. just trying new ideas, anything well, no, that'll work? No, no, ab absolutely not. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to disagree with you, but w when you've been uh, inside the business and lived in it for a long time, you begin to get a different sense of how selling works. And selling and, and the tools of selling are not original. They're not original with the art director. They're not original with the copywriter. The tools of selling are the market. And the market tells the advertiser how to sell. The advertiser isn't interested in doing anything original. The advertiser has no interest in culture. He has no interest in you, only in what's in your pocket. He has no interest in the advertisement itself, whether it's elegant or ugly or whatever. His interest is only in the transaction, and the transaction will be dictated by the market and what the market wants. The way that, uh, and, and I think uh, Professor Miller is absolutely correct about the Marlboro Man and how he's changed, et cetera, but the way he's changed is dictated by the market, not by the advertiser. The advertiser doesn't want to do anything ever that contradicts the market. He wants only to discover the desires of the market, what it wants to see, what it wants to buy, and so on. And then he wants to change the product or the information about it so it marries those desires. That's what the advertiser, what the salesman always has to do. Earl, Earl I think you should briefly explain why it is you don't believe what I think is a commonly held assumption that advertising can create desire. The, uh, they were I, not, I'm sorry, yeah. I, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. One, yeah. Once, many years ago, I worked in an advertising agency in San Francisco, and there was a pretty young woman who sat outside my office, and she did secretarial work for several people. And she came to my office one evening and said, it's 5 o'clock, and I have a date, and my boss has told me that we have something very important to do, and if I don't do it, uh, We'll be in a lot of trouble. It's very important, and yet it's an important data and so on. And I said to her, Barbara, if people are hungry and bread is not advertised, do you think they'll starve? And the next morning, she quit her job, and she became a nurse. She's a fine surgical nurse. OK. <laughs> well, uh, uh, OK, yeah. I, I think right. I'd like to engage you on this sure. subject. Because I, yeah, I, it's not clear to me whether we agree or not on something that I think is important. 
it sounds to me as if you are uh, advancing a, a version of what you know they call the mirror thesis, which is basically that advertising simply reflects uh, reality and strives to do it as efficiently as possible, right, in, in order to make the I'm not, sale. Not, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not intending not. to say that at all. Only that advertising follows the market, not reality. And the market may not want reality. The market may find reality awful. Right. Uh, but when I, it seems, see, what, what, what strikes me as, as, as feasible and what I really think is the case is that there's a very subtle kind of dialectical relationship between advertising and the world that it addresses. When you come to a point where all of our entertainments are constructed in an ad-like way, you know, when movies look like commercials, when rock videos change the nature of rock and roll, when rock music becomes a spectatorial experience as opposed to an, 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 you know, an oral one, when everything looks ad-like, uh, then it seems to me that you can cumulatively and inadvertently, and I think you would agree with this, you can affect changes in public taste and in public and mass expectation so that people can actually begin to want things or, you know, it isn't to say it creates desire, because you're quite right, desire is always with us, as Freud teaches, it's just there, it's pre-existent, yeah, but, yeah. but the objects uh, that uh, can, to which desire can attach and the, the attitude with which desire ex is expressed, I think, have been influenced somewhat by an ad-saturated culture. Would you agree with that? Yes, I, I have no quarrel with that. It's desire itself that, that can't be incited by advertising. I don't think advertising can incite, or selling of any kind can incite us to feel a greater uh, lust or, uh, uh, or love or whatever. It can't make us hungrier. It can't deal with any of the very basic desires. It can't change them. But it can study them and it can learn how to change the, the world to fit into uh, the, the wishes, the desires of its customers. So the, do the desires change? I think that, uh, that there are changes in the, in the culture that take place, of course. But I don't think that advertising necessarily wants to lead those changes. I don't think, advertising, it, I don't think it wants to do anything. It, it advertising it. It desperately follows the market. It follows people's tastes. It follows the culture. Does, does, uh, does rock and roll change because of advertising? Do the movies change? I suspect in, in as much as those are market driven, they change because of advertising. Because advertising is the most carefully constructed uh, cultural object as far as the marketability of it is concerned. Advertising is tested and tested and tested until finally they're certain that everyone will accept it. And then when uh, people in the rock business or the movie business see this uh, thing that's been made and accepted by the market, it says, that's the market. And, uh, and I think if, if uh, advertising leads anywhere, it's in studying the market, the desires of people. It's, uh, I think in some cases, brilliant at discerning people's desires in a very subtle way.